Okay, folks, the word of God is alive and powerful, isn't it? And sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God breathed. It's profitable for doctrine, for a proof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished into all good works. Study to show yourself proved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we're going to open the word of truth tonight, the Christian transformation. Lesson number 24. Before we begin, it's essential that every believer be prepared to study the Word of God. And so we're going to take just a moment of time to prepare ourselves for the technique of rebound. You understand that technique. If necessary, you use it. I'll close out our prayer time and turn our meeting over to uh, our teacher, Pastor Al Rosenblum. Heads bowed and eyes closed. You make your own way with the Lord. Father, we thank you tonight for, again, uh, the privilege of opening up your word, sitting around the table of your word with people from across the, the, the United States and across the, the planet. What a, what a, a, a just a, a joy it is to use modern technology to get the, the word of God beyond the, the four walls of our building. We know that the church is not a building. The church is people. That's us. In these last 24 weeks, we're talking about transforming our lives into the likeness of the life of the Lord Jesus. So many times, Father, I hear opposition to that. Oh, no, 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 you can't do that. It, it's impossible. No, it's impossible. That's, that's something for later on, maybe when we get to heaven. Father, your desire is for us to be transformed today, not next week, not a year from now. And I thank you for Al's ministry to us in this uh, in this area. Uh, learning to get rid of the toxic thoughts, memories, emotions that have plagued our lives for how not, how long? From the time they began. And you've given us every opportunity. You've given us every mechanism, every tool to take care of all that. I'm going to pray, Father, that uh, after 24 weeks that you're going to continue to lead Al and I into some specific areas where we can be of greater help and assistance, not only to ourselves, but to those people who are logging on with us. I turn this hour over to you now, Father, for your honor, for your glory, and for time to be able to bless each of us through the understanding of your word. So I lift this session up to you, I lift Al up to you, me up to you, every person that's online with us, up to you. Bless us, Father, for your sake, in Christ's name, amen. Let me just welcome all of you on Facebook right now. I saw several of you logged on already, and I want to welcome all of you on uh, on WebEx. Val, it's, I'm turning this over to you, I'm going to turn my camera off and my microphone. is It's yours, brother. Very good. Okay. Well, let's get some notes. Uh, you know, this uh, this lesson will be somewhat repetitious from last time and times before. But this is the most com complex discussion I believe there is. I mean, it's it's the most complex understanding of how the Christian life works. I spent many years learning the Word of God, Bible doctrine, and trying to implement it in my life with much misery and i asked myself for years where is the joy of this i mean i i felt pressure i felt burdened i felt like a failure i didn't i mean i knew that what i was on to was the truth but i couldn't make it work in my life in such a way that it freed me from the hurt and the pain and the depression and the discouragement the fear about my future i was still dominated by all of the same human thoughts and feelings that I'd had all my life. Being here to try to pull all together in such a way that we can understand it. And one of the most important issues is we begin to try to look at ourselves and understand what's going on inside. 
which which I promise you, if you will provide Jim and I some feedback, you can remain anonymous, some feedback about what's going on with you. What issues are you dealing with? What have you found or not found? Are you having trouble just even starting this process? Do you even really understand what you're being asked to do? Preached or taught? Do you really even understand what we're saying? Uh, are you are you in the process, but you're not making any headway? It's just a million variables here that could be going on with your life. Well, we can't help if we don't know. And so I know that we're accustomed in the doctrinal church to lecture where we look notes and we assimilate and we go off and think it through on our own. But this is a different type of class. This class would be better served or better taught in a group with people in attendance where questions could come up and, you know, you wouldn't mind taking side, side rabbit trails to deal with particular things. The questions that are being asked, and there are some being asked, every time I get a question, it, it implies that I've not explained many things in a, in a good way, in a full way. Begin to implement these. Please. Maybe you already know. Thing. Thing. Maybe you don't know it. Maybe you think that the, the low level emotion that you feel and experience in your life. This way so long you've concluded that you're just not an emotional person, that God did very strong emotions. I beg to differ with you on that. I don't think that's true. I think that at some point you learned how to diminish your emotion that you didn't want to feel. And that was a very handy mechanism that God built into the soul. It's pretty much an instinctive mechanism. You, we use denial. We we simply block out our mind. Of our minds see them anymore, outside out of mind. And that's all of your heart. And when you've got your heart full of these wrong ideas and these mechanisms to cover the pain of your wrong ideas, then your heart is all stopped up. I mean, we could describe it in a million ways, but your heart is blocked off, stopped up, shut down, frozen, relatively just like molasses. And for the grace of God and the love of God to flow through your life to others, this this has to get cleaned up. You know, as Paul said in 1 Timothy 1.5, the goal of all this is a pure heart. In a, in a clean conscience, I mean, excuse me, a clean heart and a, and a good conscience, which those two words, clean and good, are, are purification words. So, our emotion was designed to be free. Your emotions are intended to, to operate freely. Whatever you're thinking, your emotions should, you know, respond just uh, spontaneously. They should just respond and they should be they should be immediate. They should be free to if 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 it's an appropriate time to laugh out loud or snicker or you know or to feel sad or to weep, you're not fearful or you're not shut down. You're able to let your emotions be what they are. The rule is to feel what you feel. And that's just an old saying that comes out of counseling. You feel what you feel. You stop shutting down your feelings. So you, your emotions are intended to be free to respond to your thoughts. And with whatever appropriate feeling related to the thought you're choosing. Now, the problem, part of the problem is the effects of, the, of Adam's original sin. 
on all of us, the human race, have caused every aspect of our original design to be corrupted. There's no part of us that's not corrupted. Nothing works right in this life. Nothing's going to except for the Holy Spirit, the truth of the Word of God, and the spiritual life. That's the only thing that works right. The rest of it is messed up. It's it's corrupt. It's twisted. It's, you know, it's illogical. It's irrational. So what we do in our life, and we, this is, again, a review. We attach our needs and desires to the things here on earth instead of God. It's just inevitable that a person born into this world, separated from God with a sin nature, unable to understand God, and the devil's world is going to be attracted to the devil's world and the things of the devil's world, be they lascivious type pleasures or ascetic type pleasures, you're gonna be attracted to one of those systems and you're going to begin to uh, assimilate those systems, one or the other or both, as a way of dealing and living out your life instead of the divine system. It's where we all start. So we attach our desires to the things of the earth. And when, when, and listen, when we do, it, it inevitably results in disappointment because none of those things can satisfy. None of those things are permanent. Many of those things and people are, are they betray us. They're not permanent. They have, they struggle with their integrity. Talk to a man today who, whose parents divorced when he was young and all along the way of his early life with this back and forth between the parents, uh, he felt betrayed by some individuals involved in this. And it was just his goal now, his purpose now is he now he needs to forgive. He's never forgiven for he's never forgiven people for being thrown into the middle of a situation that nobody's prepared to handle. Nobody's prepared for divorce. Nobody. And the pressures of divorce, of being separated from your children and seeing them go live with one parent or maybe a step parent, someone else, right? I mean, the pressures of that are just tremendous. And so people get disappointed. They get hurt. They feel guilt. They feel shame. They feel shame. This is the old man's system, and this is real life. So Christianity, if anything, is real life. It's real. So we believe because we attach to the things of the earth, those things cannot fulfill us and they cannot be permanent. We get hurt. So we believe all the wrong ideas about the events of our life. See, these disappointments that happen, parents get divorced and the children have put their hope in the family unity, breaks their heart. Different things happen and these events that come along, we interpret them with wrong thinking rather than the Word of God. Now, hopefully you understand this by now. We've been saying it for 24 sessions, that we've experienced our life, many things that we called hurtful tragedies, we came away with wrong conclusions, wrong beliefs that are still in our heart, in the subconscious, still still within us and that we've not freed ourselves from, erased, replaced. These wrong conclusions about life result in painful emotions. And therefore the painful emotions, because we're not able to resolve the problem with the truth, all we can do is repress the emotion. This is me, this is you. In addition to the effects of Adam's sin, we make choices that, again, to repress our emotions and limit our ability to feel, minimizing pain. This is where everyone begins. Now, once you, once you move into this area of your subconscious, 
you begin to look at yourself. You begin to realize that you are shut down. You have shut down your emotions. And you may have done it so long ago, you think it's normal. But you, you ask yourself the questions, you know, why don't I feel things the way others appear to feel things? And uh, comparing yourself with other people is always a bad idea. But it is true that some people are more emotionally free than others. When you see someone who's able to laugh and, and I mean, belly laugh all the way to the bottom, and their emotions are free and they're not afraid and they're not angry, they're, they're literally full of peace, they're peaceful and content, then this is someone who's been able to be free to free themselves from all of this repressed pain. And they've allowed their emotions to work and operate again. So these life events that we interpret improperly as tragedy or unnecessary or wrong will always create negative emotional re reactions. Now, last week, somebody said, I don't really understand the word hurt or the word pain. Well, I said, well, do you feel shame or guilt? And they went, oh, yeah, I feel shame. Well, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about inappropriate reactions from your thinking about life events that are not from God. I mean, God does not want you to feel pain or shame or guilt. If you were believing the truth about it, you would not feel these things. But because you believe something that wasn't the truth, it caused you to feel pain. Now, the more intense the event, if you've been through some really, really difficult things, the stronger the emotional reaction. And the stronger the emotional reaction, the more hurtful to your soul. And this is important because the more hurt, the more you're, the more you're, wanting, you're going to want to isolate yourself from that, and the more your brain is literally going to isolate that memory from the rest of your other memories. It's going to be, it's going to take some effort to find it and, and deal with it. So I want to introduce an idea here. It's not a new idea, but I want to summarize this. It's, uh, it's the idea of a plan for human happiness. When you were growing up, what was your idea? What was your plan for human happiness? I mean, what were you going to be when you grew up? What were you going to do? I was going to play professional sports. I mean, like, like Dr. Jim, you know, Jim got to that level and he even played a little bit up there. I'd never made it. I had the ability, perhaps. I mean, that's what I was told. But things intervened in my life before I got there. That was what I was going to do. That was the only plan that I had. When that plan came apart, I didn't really know what to do. And that plan, when that plan came apart in my life and I didn't have a plan, it really was a painful thing for me. I was, I floundered around. I was, I was, uh, I, I was disappointed with myself and with the people in my life. And uh, my dream shattered. My dream shattered. And rightly so. And, and thank the Lord for it because the pain that I went through is what led me to the Lord to be saved. But y'all, all of us start off with a plan an idea, an image in our head that, of what we need for human happiness. Now, when something comes along and intervenes in that plan, that image, and destroys it or shatters it, that's real pain, hurtful. You know, I mean, I can look back now, 40 years later, and say, you know, not being a professional athlete, so what? I've been through much worse things than that now. Back then, at 18, 19 years old, that was a big deal to me. You know, puppy love is real to the puppy. You look back now on your life and you say, well, yeah, mom and dad got divorced or, you know, we had to go live in foster home or, you know, but I, as I look back on it now, it wasn't really that bad. See, what you're doing is you're, you're evaluating it from where you are now. You're not realizing what you thought about it then, you know, as a little kid. 
you're not able to look at it through those eyes and realize how hurtful that that really was because you blocked it all out. Talking to this fellow today, I, I was asking him about things in his past. He said, well, of what I can remember, which wasn't a lot, I said, well, why do you think you don't remember much about your past, about being a kid? He said, well, it wasn't really a good time of my life. And I think I've just sort of sort of blocked it all out. I forgot it on purpose. And I began to explain to him, you know, you're learning the word of God, but you're not going to be able to do much with it because, you know, you got a lot of forgiving to do in your life. You've been through a lot of hurtful things, things that you interpreted as hurtful. Parents divorced, step parent uh, issues, step parent divorce, then another, you know, on and on it goes. Now, again, this this human happiness plan, this plan for human happiness starts right as we come out of the baby stages of life. You know, earlier, your your idea of happiness is mama, you know, in a full belly. But the farther you grow and the older you get, the more complex and sophisticated your plan becomes. You know, and depending on how intelligent you are and what kind of goals you have, you may have a very, very sophisticated plan. You know, I mean, I knew a guy that by the time he was in junior high school, he knew he was going to be a politician. And he was really on his journey. I don't know where he ended up, but he was going to be in government somehow. And he was reading the books and doing this guy was a smart fella, and he knew he wanted to be an influencer at a worldly level. So at every level of development, your ideas become more complex about how to have happiness. When those things are shattered, and they, in, they inevitably will be shattered, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God's not going to let you be distracted unless you just insist by pursuing a worldly, earthly form of happiness. It, it, it's not for the believer. That's for the unbeliever. That's as good as it gets for them. So when these things come apart, you instinctively choose to suppress these memories, these events that you believe have shattered your plans for happiness. Now, here's an example. Here's a little kid who forms an image of his or her family. The unity of the family is necessary for happiness. And this little kid's happy as long as everyone's together. But if the parents divorce, say I'm dealing with that in my life right now as a counselor. I'm dealing with people that are either getting divorced or about to be divorced or struggling with divorce and their children are really reacting. So here's a little kid, their parents split up and their little world comes apart and it shatters their whole image. You talk about disappointment, hurt, bewilderment, you know, disillusionment. That's what this child concludes and believes and feels. Here's another one. Here's a young woman who happily imagines her beloved grandmother that's going to attend her wedding. But. Her grandmother dies before the wedding and she's heartbroken because all of her life she'd imagined her being there. You know, a lot of young women imagine their wedding and that's important to them. And they imagine who's going to be there. And this beloved grandmother was all important to her all her life. But now the grandmother is not going to be able to be there. And that's you say, well, whoop de doo Listen. Again, for the puppy, that's a big deal. Puppy loves big to the puppy. So at this person's stage of life, that type of thing can be very, very hurtful to their heart because of who they are and what they think is important. So our life events and memories with painful emotions that are attached to them are stored differently in the brain than memories of events that weren't interpreted as painful. Let me say that again. Things that you went through that were very painful to you are stored differently 
they're isolated from the rest of your normal memories. Memories that don't have lots of pain associated with them are integrated into your life. These other memories are separated out. That's why they're such uh, an issue and that's why they don't work properly. That's why they interrupt the network working properly. So painful memories are separated from the rest of the network and stored as an isolated neural cluster. And what this is for is to keep the pain, the shame or guilt connected out of conscious awareness. Our, our discussions so far have been focused on becoming aware of the wrong thinking. The reason I wanted to review this is to help you once again understand what you've done to yourself, how you've attached your heart, your desire, your dreams to the wrong things in life. And because of that, you've ended up hurt and disappointed and disillusioned in some place. And, and rather than being prepared to take that to the Lord and talk it through with the Lord and think it through with the Word of God, reach a doctrinal conclusion which you can believe and, and literally be thankful to the Lord for making his plan work, uh, you're not able to do that. And so you just stuff this thing down, you separate it out from the rest of your memories, and you put a lid on it, and it becomes uh, it becomes part of your heart. It, it literally, the analogy, it becomes one of the enemies in the land. If you use the Exodus generation and they were supposed to go in and remove all the enemy nations, this stronghold, as Paul called it, this neural cluster becomes one of the enemies in your life. It causes you to sin. It causes you to be angry or fearful or disgusted. And it's, it's, it's not that it causes you to be that. Let me restate that. You already are. You decided to be disgusted or angry or fearful when that happened. And you stayed that way. And now you try to pile doctrine in on top of it, thinking that somehow the doctrine's going to work. And it doesn't work like that. you got to cleanse your heart. Now, let's go to another level of determining the godly compared with the, either the ungodly or the non-godly. So let's differ, differentiate. First, godly behavior is beliefs, thoughts, feelings, words, and actions that align with God's own standards of proper behavior. This would be the life of Christ. This would be the word of God. These are things that you believe, think, feel, your motives, your words and actions that are, that are in the spiritual life. Ungodly behavior are those beliefs, thoughts, feelings, words, and actions that are against God's standards. These are sins uh, parlaying into evil. All right, so these are the these two are easy to spot as a rule. But what about behavior that's not godly, but it's not sinful either? That's what I call non-godly behavior. Beliefs, thoughts, feelings, words, and actions that don't directly violate God's standards of right and wrong, yet they're not motivated by love for him. They're not empowered by the Holy Spirit. They're just normal moral behavior. See, this is the self-deception of the ascetic trend yeah. who adopts moral behavior as, as and believes it's a Christian life. You want to say something, Jim? Yeah, uh, yeah. give us an example of, uh, of that. I think the godly behavior is, is clear. The ungodly yes. behavior is, is clear. But give us an example, if you can, uh, about what non-godly behavior would be. Well, any kind of moral behavior, it's human good. It's any kind of moral behavior that's not motivated by the spiritual life. It's a, it's a human being, believer or unbeliever, practicing morality. That's because that's their tendency. Their ascetic trend desires to be moral and to be righteous, to be right. It also desires on the other side of that to be critical of others, to judge others and to be better than. Uh, and they use right behavior to be better than. And so the reason for this morality is it's religious behavior. 
that would be the best way to describe it for me is that, you know, people sitting uprightly, you know, using these and thous, pretending to be better than other everybody else. You know, those are not sins, and yet they're not spiritual either. That so help. if I so yeah. if I were um, if I'm driving down the highway and I saw an automobile stop there and a young lady standing behind the car crying, and uh, you felt compassion, so you stopped and says, "What's wrong?" She says, "My my tire's flat, and I uh, I need to get to the hospital because there's an emergency there." So I get out of the car and I fix that flat tire and uh, get back in my car. She drives away and I drive away and I think, "Boy, isn't that wonderful what I did down there?" So, in other words, it's just a, an act of human good that uh, was not done in a spiritual kind of a manner. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. And and the motive is really the key issue. I mean, if you stop, if if you're if you see the girl and the Lord says to you, "Hey, stop and witness for me. Show the love of God. Show my love for this lady through helping her." See, that's the spiritual life. Now, that's a subtlety that becomes a reality to the mature believer. And many of us understand that we're led by the spirit and our motive is not just to help some young lady. And see, there's, again, there's nothing wrong with stopping and helping a young lady with her car. But what about the opportunity that God has given you to talk about him, to give the gospel, <clears throat> you know, to wit, to, to show love to this lady, uh, through the spiritual dynamics of the word of God. I mean, that's being, and see, you can even do that for selfish motives, to be praised or to be appreciated or thinking that you're earning points with God. It's religiosity, it's what it is. And let me say to, to, to my, to the people that uh, are under, that have grown up under my ministry, to them, what he's, what he's saying is it must be done from what I've called the green circle, folks. Now, that that, that may not be something that uh, you're aware of, uh, Al, in terms of what I'm teaching, but it has to do with the relationship to the spirit yeah. when you're doing these things. That, and I call that functioning from the, from the green circle. So back to you, sir. There you go. Well, these are important things. There were many things that I have found in my soul that my father taught me that were really good things, but they, they had nothing to do with God. And these were behaviors that he practiced. He, he took care of his neighbors and did things for them. And I'm not trying to judge his motives. I'm just saying that what I saw of it early in my life was to do moral things to help my fellow man. But he never mentioned Jesus or the Lord. He just did it because he thought that's what he was supposed to do. And I think he was a religious person. I think he'd been taught that that was how he earned points with God. And so it's not sinful behavior, but it's not godly behavior. It's somewhere in between. It's a goodness that is not of the Lord. Now, let's look at some passages and what we're after. See what I'm trying to do here in this section. I want you to look at yourself and your behavior what's coming out of your mouth, what kind of actions you're taking, what emotions you're feeling, pointing back to what you're telling yourself and what you're visualizing, and comparing it to the Word of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. We're so quick to compare ourselves with others and our periphery and declaring ourselves either righteous or unrighteous compared to so-and-so, you know, our next door neighbor. And, and the only person we're to compare ourselves with is the Lord. And, and what we, the more you know of him from his word, the more you're able to see, the more the spirit is able to reveal to you what, how Jesus would operate. One of the keys is selfishness. The Lord did not operate from selfishness. Now, that that doesn't mean that he just, that doesn't mean he didn't know how to say no. Some people don't know how to say no. They do whatever they're asked to do, no matter what, how much of an imposition it is. If it destroys their marriage, they'll say, oh, I couldn't say no. 
That's not what we're talking about. That's what psychology calls codependent. What we're talking about is by is is looking at what is coming from your soul to those in your life and comparing it to the Lord. So the Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 talks about the great witnesses and laying aside, you know, the 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 encumbrances and the sin that so easily entangles. Then he says, run the race with endurance. Verse two, looking away to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So we're to be looking as we run and we we observe the way that we're running our race, we're to be comparing it with him. First Peter 2.21 says that he's our example in all things in the Christian life. For e- even here you were called because Christ suffered for us, leaving an example that we should follow his steps. Point being that he's our example that we're to compare ourselves to. And when I began to do this, when I began to look at what was coming out of me toward my family and people, I mean, I had to do this today. I went to the dentist today, and there were just things being required of me that were not, they they did not please me, I will say that, with masks and all these types of things. And I found myself wanting to, to be angry with these people. And I had to stop and catch myself and and listen to the Lord and said, listen, they're, they're just afraid. They're afraid. They've been told that this is a right thing to do. They're protecting themselves. Maybe they've got a sick loved one at home they don't want to infect. Look, let it go, son. This is not your place to be angry. So I thought of what how would the Lord do this? How would he deal with these people? And it would have been, he would have, he, he would have done it graciously and firmly and staked out his biblical righteous territory and, and shared that with them through grace and love. And so I looked at what was coming out of me or wanting to come out of me, and I went, that's not from the Lord. So whatever that was in me that I was telling myself, I knew one thing, it wasn't from the Lord. I knew another thing that it needed to it needed to be removed. That that particular belief about how I shouldn't uh, be put through that, that I was better than that, that somehow I should be able to be exempt from the evil that's in the devil's world and people should just leave me alone and not try to force their uh, stupidity on me. See, these are the thoughts that I had. Now, what is that belief? That belief is somehow I'm better, that I shouldn't have to deal with the devil's world. And however appropriate or right that is, it's not real, it's not reality. And it's certainly not ministry-minded. So I saw it today, I've seen it many times, I'm working, I'm I'm digging at that thing to figure out what's behind it because I'm comparing my motives, my thoughts and behaviors with with the Lord's instead of, you know, an, another believer or other people in the office or, you know, because the perfect standard is Jesus. And you go, well, look, who can be perfect? Let me tell you something. You can in the spirit. Did you know that? You can in the spirit. Trying your best is not the spiritual life. When you're free from an old man, when you say no to the old man belief that says you should be angry at that type of imposition, you say no to it and you turn to the spirit, the spirit will enable you to deal with this in a godly way. And you can be perfect like Christ. You can deal with it the same way Christ would have dealt with it. You keep on erasing it and and removing that old way of thinking, that lie, and you can literally remove that from your soul. And in that part of your life, you're you're filled with God. Now, that's what we're after here. That's real transformation. The way you see this, the trick is seeing it. How do you discover it? How do you determine what part of your behavior is, is proper and appropriate and what part is not? You compare it with the Lord. 
So man's sinful tendency is to compare himself with others, other people. So ask yourself this tonight when you talk to your family members or whoever you're with, whatever goes on, is my behavior selfish? Am I trying to get something from me? Do I, do I feel like everyone else or at least someone else ought to be paying attention to me and, and giving me what I want? You know, or, or getting out of my way or, you know, you understand, are you being selfish? Are you requiring things of others or are you giving unselfishly to others? When you're motivated by unconditional love, and when you get your selfishness out of the way, you say, well, how do you do that? How do you get the sin nature out of the way? You don't. The sin nature is going to be there. It's in your body. But the belief that the logic that tells you that being selfish is appropriate, that who's not selfish? And I'll, every now and then I ought to get a little something from me. Is, some, is that wrong for me to get a little something from me? And, and they're not, hey, look, I live a moral life and they don't, you know, or I'm the righteous one here and they're just coming up behind, you know, I deserve. On and on we go. Things we tell ourselves that are not of the Lord. These things, God will enable you to clear these things out of your soul, believe it or not. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, let's go back to to talking about uh, asking somebody else about uh, whether you're perceived as being selfish. Yes. One of the things that, one of the things that would bother me about that, uh -huh. I don't have any problem if I were talking to you or maybe someone else of, uh, of that I felt like could be objective, but the tragedy today is there's so, there are so few people who are actually living the kind of life that we're talking about that if you ask that question, am I being selfish? It's very possible that you would get a subjective answer that really wasn't correct. Well, the, the likelihood is that you're going to get that kind of answer, depending on who you ask. Thank I mean, you very much. That's, that, I well, mean that's, the, that's the point that I wanted, I wanted to make. The rarity of an objective person, I don't think can be uh, overemphasized, but I do believe God will provide that person in your life if you ask him and that you look for that person and you're careful about who you choose, you don't go around sharing your issues with anyone. I mean, just anyone, but the Lord will send you or present to you someone in your life with whom you can say, you don't have to ask, just look at the reaction that you get. And you go, well, the reaction that I'm receiving from this other person is a subjective reaction. Okay, I, I understand that. Quite often it will be a subjective reaction. Their own issues are part of this reaction. So it's not a true reaction yet. You you learn to sift through that and, and, and see that what you're expressing to them is not unconditional, uh, edifying, benefiting, giving, you know, building them up, trying to help them. You're trying to get something from them. I think all of us here can be sensitive to know when you're wanting to get something from that person rather than give something to that person. Now, in the human realm, trying to get something from that person, that's totally appropriate you know we we have a, a contractual type relationships marriage is a contract you know i vow to do these things and i vow to do these other things and those two come together in a contract and they agree to live under certain laws and rules and 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 that's what's expected of them uh so that's a transactional human relationship but the spiritual world is, you know, love is is unconditional giving. God gives and gives and gives and never wants back, never needs anything back. So you have to ask yourself all day long as you interact with people, 
Am I being selfish? Am I being needy? Am I being greedy? You know, am I being am I being a toot head or whatever? You know, am I am I am I angry? You know, am I difficult to deal with? Uh, and why? Why do I take my anger out on other people? And what is my anger about anyway? See, these are the questions that you keep asking yourself to dig your way back to try to understand what's going on in you. It's only by understanding it and seeing yourself in the act of it that you can change it. But you can change it. And when you remove this old logic that says, I have a right to be angry, you know, or, or I, have a, I have a right to be fearful, who wouldn't be fearful? You're not fearful. You're crazy if you're not fearful. Went into this dentist. And I had this mask on, like the, our, we got a law right now, the governor said. Uh, and so I had it down under my nose. The lady behind the desk just about lost it because I had it, no, it wasn't covering my nose. So I wanted to react, and a lot of things went through my mind, uh, but I didn't. I just let it go and kept kept my peace. But... See, I looked at what was coming out of me, and and, I, and it gave me, I got a really good clue today about what's in my soul, because the fact that I wanted to react, I'm now looking at that inside, and I'm saying, what is that? Why, what am I telling myself gives me the right to do that? How is it that I have the right to react, you know, and be hurtful to another person who's simply afraid or you know, when people get afraid, they get controlling. If you've got someone in your life who's practices controlling behavior, 99 out of 100, it's a fear-based behavior. They're afraid, so they try to control everything. So if that's you, if you say, I, I can't help it, I keep trying to control my loved ones, my children, I keep trying to control my children. Well, what are you afraid of? What is the image that you're seeing in your mind that says, if I don't keep them safe and guide them and keep them out of trouble and keep them away from harm, what is your image that's going to happen to them? See, you're creating that. And therefore, it's creating this controlling behavior. So you compare that with Jesus, and it, and it helps you to see behavior that should be examined and removed erased, replaced, and, and embrace the truth of it. So let's go to Philippians 4 here and look at these five commands. From Philippians 4, 4, verses 4 through 9, we're going to have five different commands. Rejoice in the Lord always. That's a command. Present active imperative. Again, I will say rejoice. Present active imperative. So there's a command, which is really an admonition. Every imperative mood in the Bible is, is, indicates the ability of the believer to choose. It, it highlights volition and our responsibility to choose. So the Lord says, rejoice. Now, you read that command, and what if you don't feel like rejoicing? What if your soul is not full of joy and, and rejoicing? Uh, what is your capacity to honestly obey this admonition? I mean, if you're being honest with with what the condition of your soul right this moment, are you able to honestly rejoice? You go, no, I don't feel like rejoicing. You know, I don't have rejoicing in my soul. Now, I, I can work it up if you want to. I can emotionalize it and get something going if I need to, but in reality, that's not where I am in my life in a rejoicing phase. But see, that's honest. That's real. That's when you look at that command and say, I hear you, Lord, but I can't do that. I cannot honestly bring myself to do that. See, that's the beginning of a dialogue with the Lord. It's not, it's not disobedient. It's honestly just declaring your incapacity. It's honestly saying to the Lord, you got to help me. You got to show me. You know, it's like the guy, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. You're saying, I, 
I understand that if I really had everything right in my soul, I would be rejoicing all the time. But apparently I don't have everything right in my soul. And therein is the lesson. So now, are you able to even fake this command? Uh, and that's what many people do. They, they try to fake it. They try to be what they're supposed to be. And they think that living the Christian life is about learning these commands, seeing them as rules, and trying to do them out of their human energy. And this is why it looks so fake. This is why the unbeliever looks at it and said, that's hypocritical. That's not real. You know, and the all different brands and flavors of that type of Christianity. And you know it when you see it, and the people that are in it quite often don't realize that that's what they're doing. Uh, they don't realize that they're just using their human effort to try to obey these commands, and that's not what's intended. What's intended by these commands that you can't keep is to show you that you can't keep them. Same as with the law. One of the, the purpose of the law was to show you that you couldn't keep it and therefore needed a savior. Well, say, same with many of these commands. When you're at a point where you can't keep these commands, it shows you, I got a lot of work to do. I need to get busy. Now, verse five, he says, make your gentleness known to all men. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, just a second, Hill. Mm -hmm. You know, my heart is my heart is heavy right here. Yeah. In terms of in terms of this present act of imperative, you and yeah. I understand that. But when you look without without becoming political, yeah. When you take a look at all that's going on in our country today, with the upheaval everywhere. Here we are. We're sitting. We're sitting in a in a Bible class right now. We're learning something about a transformed life. And when we look at all this, all this commotion that's going on all around us, that that verse right there is going to tell us a lot about ourselves. Right in the midst of all this, I hear people tell me they're afraid. They're scared, they're worried, they're upset, they're angry, they're bitter. That is absolutely the opposite of what this verse is saying. And if we were talking, if we were talking about this being a part of the transformed life, if I were to go down this list, and it, by the way, it's alphabetical. And so it's not a matter of picking on anybody. Huh. But if I were to go down this list and say, Miss Ashley, are you rejoicing today? Leanne, Brian, Danny and Carolyn, Janet, Karen Torrance, Kat, me, um, Al, Odette, Richard, Nita, Roger, and everyone on Facebook. If you're looking at the circumstance of today and you can't rejoice, you got a problem. Yeah. Thank you, sir. You're very welcome. Yes, sir. Well, it just reveals See, the goal, God's goal for that verse is to show us where we are. Because we know if we have enough doctrine to understand that we've already won this war, whatever God allows is for good, that everything that comes to your life has been has gone across his desk and he signed off on it. It's for your growth. It's for your witness. It's for your ability to glorify him. And that that's what's really important in the whole scheme of life if you could in, if you could hold all that in your mind at one time and be free from all of your worldly considerations boy you could actually obey that command so getting to that pl that place is the is the goal of christian transformation getting to that place that you have to the reason you can't rejoice is because you're unhappy about your circumstances and you're still so hooked in to those circumstances as if we go under communist rule that somehow that's going to be the end of life as we know it and, and, it, and it, in a human sense it will be but in a spiritual sense it'll probably be the best opportunity we've ever had yeah. so well just one more thought out before and i'll get out of the way again but you know in terms of in terms of a failure, not being able to rejoice. Again, this, this is an imperative. It is a command. 
And yes. if we're dealing with a transformed life, we need to realize that if we're not doing that, when you look at the pressure in your life, this is God's attempt to get your attention that you are out of line in this area, if not in, in out of line in other areas. God will, God will show us that there's something wrong, that we're not practicing this transformed life and moving in that direction. So there's a, there's a consequence for not practicing this. Is that correct? Well, I don't, uh, that would be a very ascetic way of approaching that, uh, which well, I'm not an ascetic. <laughs> I know Sorry. I see it, you know, you know, having been adopted into God's family and becoming one of his children, I see more as it, it, it rather than being a judicial issue, which of course, all that's been resolved. I see it more of a, as a training issue. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. This is I'm not talking about punishment. Right. I'm talking exactly. about things not yeah. working right for you. And because yeah. they're not working right, I, I don't I don't believe God's punishing us. But disciplining us, training us, trying to get us to do it right, we we we're gonna have to recognize that uh, that God is getting our attention somewhere along the line. It just so happens we're talking about rejoicing here, but this would be true of any command in the Bible. Any failure to be transformed to the likeness for Christ. He's going to show us that there's a consequence here. He's training us to get this thing right. Oh, sorry. Back to you, sir. That's all right. No, that's please inter interject all, all you want. Uh, this, this type of command is one of the first things that alerted me to the fact that that, that my spiritual life was not working appropriately. Because I kept reading things like this, and I I just had come to a place of honesty. I had come to a place where I had given up on trying to give God what I thought God wanted from me. Going through the motions, you know, giving God the right answer, you know, the the calling it a test in the sense of it's a test to see how well I'm going to do uh, with this adversity. And the test was about testing me rather than the word of God. And I just was at a place where I was so discouraged about my spiritual life and my life in general that I just said, forget that. And I just got very honest with God. I, I said, I can't do that. I mean, I read in the Bible where these people are rejoicing in that the spiritual life is producing happiness for them. What's wrong with me? Why is it working that way for me? And again, this is when we began this journey, and he began to show me that I had stuffed my soul with all of these wrong ideas that were in the way of the truth of the Word of God being able to be real to me. It wasn't that I didn't believe it. I knew it was true. My spirit knew it. But my heart, my subconscious was, was unable to, to assimilate it and put it into practice in a way that it became my reality. And that's what we're after here is for the word of God to become your inner reality so that you can look at all that's going on. I mean, I've been so upset about the nation and the lies, just the, the propaganda that's going on. Just insane. It's just a point of history where it's, it's interesting to live through one of these times of history. This is similar to the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia and the, the Mao Revolution in China. What's going on in Cuba? This is the same exact thing that went on. And, it, and if we allow it to happen, it, then, then so be it. We're going to live under that, and our children are going to live under that. And, and that's a choice that we have to make. But rejoicing, being able to be gentle, verse 5, make your gentleness known, another imperative. I mean, what comes out of your soul to other people? And so you don't really have to ask them. You can see by the way they respond. I mean, if, and I have, I have girls in my home and if I get too harsh, I don't have to ask them if I'm harsh. I can see it. I see their spirit shut down. I see them turn off, you know, I see them. They won't look at me, you know, they're just, they begin to ignore me. They just turn me off because being harsh. 
And boy, that hurts me when I see that coming out of me and I, and I dig back and I look and so what is creating this harshness toward these girls that I love with all my heart? Why in the world would I ever do that? So I have to look for an answer more than just, I'm a sinful guy. You ought to, you ought to forgive me. See, that's a cop out. I'm a sinful guy. You ought to forgive me. Uh, I mean, who's perfect. Are you perfect? Yeah. See in the spirit, you can be perfect. You live by the word of God in the spirit. If you get the old man's stuff out of the way, that's the trick. So is your soul characterized by gentleness that you can express to every person? And by the way, what is the general disposition of your soul? I mean, if Pete, when people meet you and they're around you for a little while and you go, well, look, I need you to give me a little report card on what you see. Somebody really honest and discerning. What do you see? I mean, do they say, well, boy, you're a, you're a happy person. You're sure as a peaceful, you know, uh, uh, upbeat person, or are you angry? Do you have a bitter soul? Do you have a contented soul? Are you fearful about your future? You know, are you nervous? See, all of these things come from within you, and they come from what you believe, and they come from the lies that you believe about how life works and about how what God is doing in your life. And these are things, these are training issues. They're not, like, like Jim said, we're not, God is not looking to punish us for not being able to do these things. He's trying to show us that our inability to do these things are the areas where we need to work on our soul, ourselves. So, he yeah, says, be angry. Yes, sir. One more thing here, you know, in terms of uh, being willing to, to confess publicly, this has been a problem that I've had yeah. over the years. Uh, my ascetic trend would not allow me to be gentle. Um, no, I'm, I'm teasing here, you know. Al and I had a talk about this a little while ago. He's, he says he has a trend toward asceticism, and I was teasing, but I did too. But, <laughs> but that's just the opposite of that. And I, in, in this area, is your soul characterized by gentleness? I, I have to say the answer was no. Yeah. But I can say that because of my, because of, of just this very 24 weeks, this has been pointed out to me, and I'm having I'm working on that because I know that I have not been a gentle person in the past. Right. But it's something that I'm working on. Absolutely. See, and and what happens is you see these things and you have to just be honest about it. And when you are and and you realize that every other person studying here with us today has got their own area, their own issues, their own problems that are exactly the same as yours. It takes away the feeling of being singled out. Or it takes away the embarrassment when you realize that Adam's sin has infected us all and caused us to have these particular areas where we're angry or, or we're not gentle or we're you know, we're fearful. It, we all got some part of that. We all are infected in some specific way. And so, look, when you share yours with me, Jim, I'm not surprised, you know, at all, because I've got the same thing. It just may be a different brand of it. And when we're able to finally just all relax and be honest with each other, this is when you can help each other because you're not afraid of being judged anymore. You know, who cares if you judge me? Listen, nobody's, listen, my sins have already been judged on the cross of Jesus Christ. And so I'm no longer a victim to your judgment or your criticism. I don't care. Criticize me if you want to. It doesn't matter. You know, my sin's been paid for. You know, God himself has dealt with my sin, <laughs> you know, much, much higher than any rest of us. So it frees you to be able to be open and honest about yourself and what you're struggling with so that others can can join in or share or see themselves i see it as part of ministry so all right he says be anxious now you say well how do i do that and i love you you know that's the what without the how how am i supposed to do that well what is the image in your soul that's creating the anxiety do you see that how are you able to a way of looking at life? Creating the fear. 
I mean, is it about the future? Is it you're going to end up alone? You're going to end up broke and destitute, living under a bridge, or you know, you're going to end up by yourself in a nursing home somewhere, not being cared for? I mean, is that what you're afraid of? Well, that'd be an interesting challenge if that comes to that, because God will certainly use that as as bringing you to the witness stand for you to overcome the evil of the devil's world, the evil of that sorry so you know what and overcoming his worst that he could possibly do with God's best that's coming through you. So it doesn't matter where you end up. And you know, none of us want to end up like that. None of us want to end up living under a bridge. Uh, You know, we'll work for food or whatever. Uh, Nobody wants to do that. But look, when those, when in the time of Jesus, there were, there were thousands of people like that who had nothing. There was no social security. You know, that's really an invention since about the 30s. Uh, But the point being, the fear is coming from an image in your soul, a scenario that you're running that's making you anxious and making you fearful. You can erase that. You can remove that. and You can replace it with one of God standing right there with you, you know, marching you through life, protecting you, providing for you. He says, whatever is true. See, here's a good one. How are you doing on this one? Whatever is true, honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence or virtue in life, worthy of praise, let your mind focus or dwell on these things. So how focused are you normally on these true, right, pure, lovely, reputable, and and excellent things in life. I mean, is this what you focus? See, this is where Paul is teaching us to take our faculties, our visual and verbal faculties, and, and attach them to the right things in life. Now, this only works when you've removed the wrong, the habituated false ideas that have been enslaved your faculties for so long where those are the scenarios you run and the things you talk about creating fear and anger and worry and bitterness and jealousy you gotta you gotta take off the old man that's why it comes first paul said in ephesians 4 22 through 24 take off the old be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new verse 9 hey, he said these things you've learned and seen and received in me practice these things. So again, what do you normally practice? What is it that you choose to do moment to moment in your life? And look, there's none of us that are going to reach perfection in this life. Not a, not a chance. It's just too much old man stuff all the way to the core. You're born in Adam. You're born with your core in Adam. And removing all of those things is just not feasible, but it's the goal and it's where you ought to shoot for You ought to go for every bit of it, but look at what's coming out of you. What are you choosing? How do you behave? What are the words that you use? What is the tone of voice that you use with other people? I mean, what do you think and feel most of the time in your life? What words come from you with what tone? Are you selfish, angry, bitter, fearful, or have you grown beyond the normal human reactions to have the capacity to obey these commands. These five commands can only be obeyed by a believer who has grown spiritually by erasing any false thinking about any of these areas of life, replacing their lives with biblical truth, then embracing the truth to form a new habit of life. Jim, if we don't get to it, I I didn't mean to, I meant to get farther than this, but Listen, let me summarize some things as we get come to the end of this. When you got saved, the Holy Spirit put in you this new man capacity, the capacity to learn and believe and, and uh, actualize, as, as Steve Ellis would say, the truth of God's word, to, to be able to visualize and verbalize within yourself this relationship, this real relationship you have with God. The Holy Spirit takes the word of God in your soul through your choice to 
be positive to it, to believe it, to learn it, to believe it, to apply it. The Holy Spirit empowers all of that to make the spiritual life operate. The only thing standing in the way of you being able to operate like Christ is all of the wrong things you put in your soul. This is what's in the way. You have a perfect system. God gave you a perfect, effective, every single time system. There's nothing that can beat the new man system. When you, under the power of the Spirit, apply the Word of God to your system, situations in life, it wins every single time. Now, what's keeping that from happening? It's not more, it's not new, you don't have enough knowledge of the plan, of the system, you already know how to operate, you know, from the green circle in the new man, you know, to use, you know how to use Operation Cry, confess your sins and imagine and realize that you're free from that and you can live in the new man, you know these things. What's keeping that from happening? It's not the Holy Spirit keeping it from happening. I promise you that. It's not God. It's not the Word of God that's keeping that from being your reality. What it is is you're still hooked. Your mind, your faith, your your attention, your focus, your visual and verbally vitalizing is still hooked to the old things of this life. You're still preoccupied with it. You're still pursuing them. You're still reacting to not getting them. You're still reacting to the things that happened in your life. All of that is still in the way of you living the Christian life. So you say, well, how do you make this work? Let me tell you, you don't make it work. The spirit makes it work. The truth makes it work. You got to get your lies out of, out of God's way and then be willing to believe what God says moment to moment to moment. And this thing will work for you. You become powerful. Joy will begin to form in you. Contentment, contentment will begin to form in you. You won't be so distracted off by your discouraged. You know, something happened 12 years ago and you've never really gotten over it. You've tried to get over it. And you've suppressed it and you've gone on with your life and you've distracted yourself with with asceticism and you keep everything a your, your house is neat as a pen. Everything about your life is perfectly organized. You never say a word out of place. Everything is perfect. And yet you're miserable. You've never gotten over this hurtful thing in your life. Look, and you're not, that's not living the Christian life. I don't care how perfect it all appears. See, the ascetic trend, well, we're all, it's not just the ascetic, we're all focused on the effects. We're trying to create an effect rather than letting the effects take care of themselves and creating a motive, a reality, a reality within between you and God. This is what this is about. This is why it gets so personal. This is about you and all of your fears and worries and angers and disappointments and shortcomings and flaws and failures and the way you've reacted to your life. It's all personal stuff. You know, it's not academic, objective information. It's your personal baggage. It's your personal, you know what? And airing it out is very difficult. And pulling it out, even looking at it yourself is difficult. But it must be done. You know, it must be pulled out. It must be pulled apart. It must be discovered for the motive behind it and the beliefs that are that are empowering it. And they must be laid out, laid aside and replaced with the truth. And so I hope that's helpful to you. Yes, sir. Let me give you, let me give you a, a question or something to think about between now and next, uh, next Wednesday. Yes. yes. You talk about peeling the onion. Yes. And uh, we're talking about finding uh, the, the thought behind our emotion that's creating this anger, bitterness in us. Question. How do you know if you're peeling the onion? How do you know when you get down to the core of the onion? Well, that's that's that'd be for next week. We're out of time. Okay. <laughs> and, I won't answer that. Oh, well, yeah. Okay. Good. Very good. Well, press out of here, brother. Press out of here. Okay. All Father, right. We thank you tonight for the privilege of uh, of studying your word and listening to the 
to the mechanics, now, not just the what, but the how to's. Um, I don't know how in the world anybody would, uh, would not come to this session and say, listen, this is powerful information. Uh, my thought is that uh, oftentimes we we don't have to scream, we don't have to shout, we don't have to be um, angry, but sometimes Father is just a body language that shows us there's something there that we've not yet reached the core of that onion. Father, I want transformation for my life. I want it, and I want it for everyone else, but it's a personal choice. And I'm choosing, Father, to, to follow that path. Thank you for Al. Thank you for all that are online with us. We're looking forward to next Wednesday night and actually looking forward to the next uh, next session we have, whether it's uh, tomorrow night with uh, Sir Darrell or uh, Sunday night with Al. There are many, many opportunities to take in the word of God. Continue to honor and glorify yourself through the teaching of your word and the transformed life that comes about in those lives who are desirous to change. We praise you for this night, Father, in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Good night, everyone. Good day. Yes, good night. Mm -hmm.